Okay, I think um, it's about time to get started. A couple more people wandering in, but we'll let them, we'll let them wander in. Um, so my name is Norman Bobo. I met most of y'all as you were coming in. Um, I'm the general gopher. Uh, I've been helping Scott uh, for a couple months now on various things with the Convention of State Project uh, here in Tennessee. Um, I want to go through a few things first, and I'm going to then introduce our speaker. Um, the, uh, I want to recognize some people in the audience. Um, we're going to have a presentation that's going to last about an hour or so. And uh, during that presentation, if you have questions that are popping up, because you know, sometimes you get to the end and you forget the question that you thought about, we gave you some cards. If you have a question that pops up in your mind, you want to go ahead and write that down. Um, I'll tell you what, the, probably the easiest thing to do is pass them to the inside aisles. And we'll pick them up during the presentation. You'll see us kind of going up and down the aisles a little bit and picking them up. And we're going to sort them by topic so that we can collate all the topics together. And that'll make it a little more efficient when we're answering the questions. The, uh, um, but we're going to do an hour presentation roughly and then about an hour of uh, question and answer. We're going to start with the cards. And then if we still have time after that, we'll take questions directly from the audience. But we'll start with the cards. Um, I want to thank uh, Creve Hall, Church of Christ, and the elders uh, for allowing us to use this space today. Uh, they did so free of charge to us, uh, which is always beneficial to those of us who are in volunteer organizations. Um, if you would uh, try to do your best to be respectful to the space and to the building, um, try not to, to um, drink or eat other than the water bottles that we've uh, given to you. Uh, try not to drink or eat in the building. Um, as far as uh, bathrooms go, some of you found that they're a little ways away, but I'll tell you where they are. Go out the auditorium and turn left. Go all the way to the end of the hall. There's two bathrooms there. We prefer you skip those. Go to the end of the, the, the last door. You'll see is open on the left. You'll walk into the main foyer in front of the large auditorium, and you'll see the men's and ladies' rooms there on the left. So we prefer if you would to, to use those. So go all the way out to the end of the auditorium, or the end of the chapel here, all the way to the end of the hall, turn left. So it should be fairly easy there. Um, if you would uh, do me a favor, and this is you know, pretty standard stuff, if your cell phones, go ahead and put them on silent so that they're not ringing uh, during the day. And if you need to take a call, um, do us a favor and just step out into the foyer. Um, we'll be closing the doors here in just a minute. And I think that's about it. I want to start off by recognizing any of our military. If you are current or former military, if you'd stand, please. Thank you very much. Just come around and applaud. And I also want to recognize any of our current or former law enforcement officers. If you're a law enforcement officer of any kind, if you'd stand as well, please. We almost always have some. There we are. Thank you very much. There are also a couple of people in the audience that I want to, to recognize. One of them, uh, Ben, if you'd stand. Where are you? There you are, Ben. Stand, please, so people see who you are. <laughs> um, ben is the president of the National Tea Party. Um, and he's a mover and a shaker uh, in Nashville. You definitely want to get to know Ben, but also get, sign up for Nashville Tea Party on Facebook and do all the other stuff. You'll see it on his website as well, on their website, I should say. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit more about, uh, about Ben in, in just a second as well. And I see Sheila has walked in. Sheila, if you'd stand, please. Sheila Butt is the representative uh, for... <laughs> Sheila is the state representative. Which district? I forget the number. 64. 64, which is essentially Columbia. And Murray County. In, in Murray County. Okay. All right. And important to us today, Sheila is the sponsor of our bill in, in the House, in the Tennessee House. Are you all hearing me on this? There we go. That's better. Okay. Um, I also want to recognize Tricia Hennessy Stickle. Tricia, if you'd stand up for a second. All right. <laughs> the, uh, uh, Tricia is the um, leader of the um, drawing a blank, Mari County Tea Party. And they have about 100 members down in uh, the Columbia area. And uh, if you are down in that area, that's a good organization to get connected with as well. Um, there are a couple other people I'm still expecting, and if they pop in by the time we, uh, uh, by the time I finish here, I'll, I'll recognize them as well. But so our topic here today, um, we all know that there are um, big issues in our country which are calling for a big solution. Um, 
Those of us who've already been working with the Convention of States project uh, believe that we have that solution, which is an Article 5 amending Convention of the States with a general topic call. And you'll understand what I'm saying later on as we go through the presentation. We hope by the end of the day that uh, you're going to agree that this is the solution um, and that the strategy that we have to implement that solution will also work. Um, without exception, all of us that are working on this project believe that our solution and our strategy can and will bring our country back from the brink. And that's, I'm sure most of you in the room agree, our country's on the brink. And so we want to restore our constitutional republic. That's what we're trying to do. And we think we have the way to do that. And we'll talk about it as we go through. So I've recognized some of the local leaders um, and you know, most of them in Tea Party, but there's, there are a whole group, whole, lots of groups that are conservative groups, fire, Tennessee Firearms Association, there are a bunch of other groups that are all, in the, all across Tennessee and all across Middle Tennessee in particular for today. Um, and there, there are groups all over. We want you guys, by the end of today, if you're not involved with us, we do want you to get connected with somebody. Start doing something if you're not already doing that, okay? So, by the fact that you're out here today, we already know that you're leaders. We already know that each one of you is a leader. You took off on a Saturday that's a beautiful day outside. March Madness is going on. Um, you came in here instead. That, mean, that means that you're a leader already. You're a leader. So if you ask any one of the people, and the reason why I recognize these people, if you ask any one of the people I just recognized, you'll find that they all started their leadership in very small steps, right? Um, at some point, each of them attended their first meeting, like today, um, or sent their first email to a lawmaker, or made their first call to a lawmaker. With those baby steps underway, they then grew in their activism, and now they're uh, at least Middle Tennessee leaders, if not some of them statewide leaders. Okay? So you don't have to aspire to be in their positions and doing their roles, performing their roles but you do need to be doing something. You need to be active. And today shows that you're interested in it. We want to make sure that you get connected. Um, so again, um, we hope you choose to work with us in the Convention of States project, um, but it's not a sole thing. Uh, most of us are working on many things, um, and you know, we're not all involved just in, on one topic or one group. Um, but uh, we do want you to become activated, and if if you find that after today that you're maybe not interested in, in this being your main project, speak to these other leaders. Find out and get connected. All right. So I want to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Um, this man loves our country. I've learned a lot about him in the last few months. He loves our country, and he is, he is highly qualified to speak to us on the Article 5 process and the Convention of States project. Um, he has proven his love of country again and again, first and foremost, he served our country in the military. He was a chief warrant officer and a UH-1 helicopter pilot in Korea, including serving along the demilitarized zone um, on the Korean border and acting as a liaison between the US Army and Korean units. He also served as a medevac pilot in the United States, Central America, and many other countries around the world. During his service, he performed hundreds of medical evacuations and search and rescue missions, including operations in hostile environments. Um, second, he shows his love of country not only in his military service, but also in his politics. Um, he's been involved in politics all the way back to Nixon's run for office when he delivered leaflets door to door. Um, and he's remained engaged ever since. While he was living in New York State, he ran for the U.S. Senate. Unfortunately for New York and for our country, he came in second in the Republican uh, primaries, where he experienced firsthand the effects of the establishment system on our political system. Okay. Um, it takes a lot of courage to run for office, and our speaker displayed not only that courage, but also the skill to come in second place ahead of other better-known candidates in that race. Third, he shows his love of country by participating in our capitalist economy. He's worked in several IT companies, including American Home National Builders, IBM Corporation, Precision Service Group, and Benedict Company. He was formerly an independent financial advisor for individuals. And there he experienced the effect of government can have on our business he was essentially forced to sell that business because of the Frank Dodd financial reform bill. So he's currently performs competitive and market intelligence analysis for venture capitalists and startups. And he also serves as a business advisor for startup companies. His current company, Wilco Media LLC, 
is a new game design and development company, and they just relieved, uh, released their first game titled Limbs Wall. So if you want to search for that afterwards, that might be cool. Limbs Wall, L-E-M apostrophe S. Um, so our speaker certainly loves our country. He's also qualified to speak to us on the Article 5 process. His interest in the Constitution started back in his school age years, you know, back when students still recited the Lord's Prayer and the Pledge each day, right? Um, that interest continued to grow through his, political, through his years in politics. He found an outlet for his interest by teaching Constitution 101 classes to Boy Scouts, Civil Air Patrol, and homeschool groups. He's currently serving as a Tennessee State Director for the Convention of States Project, and in that capacity, he speaks regularly with constitutional experts on a host of issues concerning the Constitution and Article 5. He's been asked, and neither already knew or has since found the answers to just about every question one can ask about Article 5. And I know, I've drilled it. Um, our speaker is, is very highly qualified to speak on these topics. So love of country and love of Constitution go hand in hand. Um, our speaker recently wrote an article describing a rescue mission that he flew in the Honduras. A plane went down near the airport, and even though he was low on fuel and it was a very high-risk situ situation, they had to search for those survivors. Unfortunately, when they arrived on site, they discovered that the two pilots on that plane had died in the crash. Uh, they barely made it back to their base. Our speaker writes at the end of that recent article, and I quote now, I found out years later that the names of the pilots and where they were from, giving their last full measure to preserve freedom, our way of life that day, were Captain Ronald, excuse me, Donald F. Benton, Jr. and Captain Ronald B. Schatz. Pray for their families and pray for our country. We forget because we have lived these past 29 years, but if these men could see us today, they would not recognize the country that they died for. That is my point. Every day we allow our country to morph away from a full functioning republic, we dishonor their sacrifice. We mock, we mock what they have done. These men and the many men who have died before and since then can no longer defend this constitution. They did their job. We the living must still do ours. The republic is in danger and the last legal, moral, and nonviolent way to save it is before us. Join with me in the Convention of States project. We need you to enter the fight. Yes, it's that important. And we'll welcome to the stand Scott Williams. Make sure I'm on here. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, Norman, thank you for that more than gracious introduction. <laughs> I'm always told that you should start these things with, uh, with a joke, but I really don't have any. Uh, this is way too serious a situation. So instead, I'm going to try to uh, very uh, calmly go through the process of what we see as a solution and some of the issues that we've uncovered and things that I think we can do to correct where we've kind of gone off the rails. I call it government gone wild, um, and it certainly has. Before I do, uh, I started with, uh, with a meeting some time ago, and I had someone ask an interesting question. And I was so impressed with the question, I decided to add it in to my slide deck. And it's an interesting one. Not that I would wish this for real on anything, but I want you to consider, let me get my device going here. I don't have to do this manually. If you were king for a day, what one amendment would you pass? Now, I'm not going to call on anyone, but if you can think of an amendment that you'd like to have passed, if you could do it with a wave of the hand, raise your hand. I think just about everyone here can think of an amendment they'd like passed. Uh, and that's kind of the point. There's no one here that's really going to argue the point that we don't have a government that's gone wild, that we don't have a government that is no longer following its constitutional bounds as we see them, as they're originally written. The problem, federal government is out of control. You have to pardon me. I am so thankful that Marco Rubio gave up his political career so that all of us in podiums can drink water everywhere. <laughs> Uh, you, you get a little parched up here, and I stole that from a good friend of mine, but it's, it's absolutely true. The, 
problem with our government is that we have uh, checks and balances that are supposed to be followed. We, of course, we have the executive and the legislature and the judicial. We also have the Senate and the House. The House was always supposed to be a people's representation, and the Senate was supposed to be representation of state interests. So not only did we have a separation of powers between the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, we even had a separation of powers within the Congress itself between states' interests and individual interests and the executive interests. And that balance of power was upset when we uh, passed uh, amendment, the 17th Amendment, which gave us direct elections of senators as opposed to states appointing them. And of course, we now have a fourth branch of government, an unrecognized behemoth. It's an alphabet soup of agencies that write law as if they were in Congress. Our Congress has effectively abdicated their role of doing that, and much like Rome of old, uh, they're allowing subgroups to do their work for them. Again, we have a national government, state government, local government, and now this alphabet soup bureaucracy that wasn't really included in the original checks and sums and balances, but that's what we have today. The Constitution didn't create those four, it created the three. But really what we have is from top down a national government that is all encompassing. We've got an alphabet soup agency that is working uh, at their direction and sometimes not at their direction on their own accord. Uh, and then we have state governments which have lost their sovereignty. Uh, they have become vehicles uh, that the federal government uses to police their national policies. And then, of course, local government is so hamstrung by uh, requirements that come down from the state, by requirements that come down from the federal government, it's hard for them to, to make any real movements for their own local communities. Now, of course, these are very broad statements, and you can nitpick them, but in essence, this is the kind of environment that we're operating in today. Really, our founders looked at it differently. The national government was really the smallest piece. Our state government, and then our local government, and then finally, even self-government, were preeminent over the federal government. The federal government was there to do things collectively that we couldn't do on our own, national defense being one of those. Uh, it'd be very difficult if Vermont had to defend itself from any other nations in the world, where collectively, as the United States, we could do that. Major abuses perpetrated by the federal government, we've talked about this, the three branches are exceeding their limits of authority given by the Constitution as it was originally written. Uh, Washington has gradually amassed this power. It hasn't been done overnight, it's been done, uh, some would argue from Woodrow Wilson, some would argue from a little bit before then, possibly even uh, Theodore Roosevelt, certainly from FDR's time. Uh, they've slowly, like eating an elephant, one bite at a time, taken our liberties. We've also experienced out of control spending and debt. Uh, it really is an intrusion into every area of our lives. And I call this tyranny, or as Mark Levin calls it, I'll steal his phrase, soft tyranny. Uh, it is not a, a tyranny of, of jackbooted Nazis walking through the streets. We don't have that kind of tyranny. It's a tyranny of a thousand cuts. It's a tyranny of the bureaucracy. Uh, and it happens, we don't even know it. Most of you drove here and I would dare say there's probably at least one law somewhere that we all broke getting here. And we're not even realize it. Is the Constitution the problem? I have people ask it all the time. You're talking about doing constitutional amendments. Is the Constitution the problem? Do we need to change the Constitution? Well, I think that's the wrong question. The Constitution, as interpreted and perverted by the Supreme Court, by Congress, and the executive branch is the problem, not the Constitution itself. Current interpretation is a violation of original intent and has led to virtually all the problems that we have today. It really has. So will Congress ever pass an amendment to curtail their power? And when you think about it, even the original 10 amendments, they, they had to be uh, convinced, although they promised, that they needed to pass them. And that was the last time they curtailed any of their own problems. The federal government will never voluntarily relinquish that. Uh, they've shown time and time again that they are incapable of bringing themselves under control. And we've got an $18 trillion debt to prove that. As, uh, as Norman had told you, I was a financial advisor. 
And one of the things that I looked at when I looked at economics and what was going on in our country, we've got $18 trillion in outstanding debt, but that's debt on the books. When you look at the uh, unfunded mandates, when you look at the uh, uh, debts that we're assuming for future liabilities, we're closer to 180 to $220 trillion. Understand, there are not $220 trillion in the world. We don't have the money. If only one amendment managed to get passed, it could create more problems because it would only address a single issue. Washington will never fix itself. And I know we've passed uh, the balanced budget amendment. And we did so with good intentions here in Tennessee. And I'm not sure exactly how that will fall out. But one issue that we need to consider was what if we only passed a balanced budget amendment that also did not have spending limitations onto it. All we've done is given Congress a blank check that says, raise my taxes, we have to have a balanced budget. Because they're not going to cut spending on their own unless they're forced to by some outside vehicle. And I would hope that that would be attached to it. But that's only one area. There's still many areas that aren't addressed simply by that one amendment. From James Madison, every word of the Constitution uh, ultimately decides a question between power and liberty. And he's absolutely true. Ultimately, every law, those 80,000 pages of the Federal Register, it's 80,000 pages of law that in some way curtails something that we can do in this country. That is tremendous. That was just 2013. I forget the last estimate. It was something like 18 tractor trailer loads it would take to print the entire Federal Registry. That's an enormous amount of law. As time has come for the states and the citizens to take back the power rightly given to us by the Constitution. The founder's solution was through Article 5. They knew this day was coming. They understood the heart of man. They understood that bureaucracies, by their very nature, seek more power. And over time, they're going to build power unto themselves. They'll create new departments and they'll create new uh, issues of the Royal Electrification Bill, passed in, what, 1932, I think. Uh, someone will correct me on the date. We still have that today. Do we have rural areas sitting without electricity that we need to have the Royal electri Electrification Bill still on the books? They create laws that just never die. They take a life of their own. The founders gave us two methods to provide amending the Constitution, and we're going to talk about those. But first, I want to go through Article 5 real quick. It's a short paragraph. Uh, basically, Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. That's all it can do. Which, in either case, shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of the Constitution, when it's ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by convention in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by Congress. So the first process, very straightforward. Congress offers these amendments. This is the way we have done all 27. Uh, well, actually, 26. The 27th one was part of the original Bill of Rights, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, ratified uh, by three-fourths of state legislatures or ratified by uh, conventions in three-fourths of the states. Congress can choose either way. Uh, they've only chosen the ratification uh, one, or the, uh, yeah, the ratified by conventions the one time, and uh, that was a repeal of prohibition, if I'm not mistaken. All the others have gone the other way. Amendment two, or the process two, is the states calling a convention of states. We need two-thirds of the states to call for a convention that means 34 of them in today's environment. And then anything that gets out of the convention goes back to the individual states on a standalone basis, amendment by amendment. And then that gets voted on, either through uh, ratification through our state legislatures or by uh, conventions again. But again, it has to be 38 states to accept any one amendment before it becomes part of the Constitution. <coughs> that means 13 states is all it would take to block any one amendment coming out of this amending process. Our founding fathers, and specifically George Mason, saw what was coming. 
He understood the nature of government. He understood where it would go to. And he argued in June, in the beginning part of the, of the Constitutional Convention, that we needed to have an amending process. And in that amending process, it shouldn't be the national legislature that approves them. They can offer them, but they shouldn't be the ones to approve them. That's too much power in one government body. The states need to approve whatever amendment that Washington might come up with, or at that time the, the Constitution would come up with. Um, and then he argued later on in September, in fact, the last three days of the convention, uh, or two days on September 15th, that no amendments of the proper kind would ever be obtained by the people if the government should become oppressive. Therefore, we need to have the second way, states offering amendments to the Constitution. And he was absolutely right. We will never get this current Congress, or any Congress, any modern Congress, to pass amendments that are going to curtail their own power. Is Congress really going to pass a term limit bill? I don't think they're going to. They're too comfortable up there. And further, James Madison, in a letter to Edward Everett, um, Edward Everett, for, for those of you who may have forgotten, was the uh, first speaker at Gettysburg. He went on for some two hours before Abraham Lincoln uh, took the podium. But in a letter to, to uh, Edward, uh, James Madison says right here, should the provisions of the Constitution as here reviewed be found not to secure the government and rights of the states against usurpation and abuses on the part of the United States, the final resort within the purview of the Constitution lies in an amendment to the Constitution according to a process applicable by the states. This is Article 5 he's talking about. So they knew this day was coming, and they were salient enough to provide a solution for when things got so bad, a, a if you will, an in-case-of-emergency break-glass provision that we can use when times get desperate. And I would ask anyone here if they don't really think the times are desperate now. Calling a convention of states is the only realistic way to curb abuses by the federal government. Again, Washington will never fix themselves. Uh, many conservative groups should consider helping us. We have, for example, 69 of the 99 state legislature bodies controlled by Republicans. And that is one of the safeguards. Uh, 34 states, or 38 states have to pass any amendment for it to become part of the application. But the states themselves have legislative bodies. So the states either have to, by Congress, call a, a convention themselves internally within the state, or by each body within the state legislature, which means the House will vote on it and the Senate will vote on it. It has to pass both before it will become part of the Constitution. So what is the role of Congress in an Article V convention of states? Well, they really have two roles. The first role is an administrative role and that is to call a convention, and it is not optional. The word is shall. Shall means they have the administrative duty to call that convention. There is no other option for them. The other one is in determining the mode of ratification. Do they want to do it by the state legislatures, or do they want to do it by intrastate conventions? That's the only decision they have in this whole process. Outside of that, they have no control over a convention of states. Congress has no control, the president has no control, the judiciary has no control, governors have no control. This is state legislatures and we the people. And that's the important part. We need to communicate with our state legislatures. They need to know what we're thinking. They need to know what it is we want them to do. So there are some objections and I want to talk about those up front. There's a fear of a runaway convention. This is not a constitutional convention, as some people might suggest. This is an amending convention, as it was very specifically in Article 5 that I just read. The purpose of the convention was to propose amendments. Proposing amendments does not mean they can do anything else but propose amendments. Conventions must be called with every state having the same application. So there isn't a fear of different states getting together and I've got an application for term limits, and I have an application for balanced budget, and I have an application for voter ID. That's not going to get a convention called. They all have to be on the same topic. In fact, there's been almost 700 calls for a convention of states from the beginning of our country, and there have not been the requisite 
two-thirds total for any one call to be triggered into a convention of states. Um, the very first one, and I'll, I'll let you know what that one was, it was from Virginia in 1789. Congress had just convened. Uh, the president had been installed, and we were promised the Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights were not forthcoming. So the Virginia legislature turned around and said, if you're not going to do this, then we're going to force it. Here's our Article 5 application. And on that application, only then did Congress step forward and say, okay, we're going to do a Bill of Rights like you promised. Now, they started with 12. The first two uh, were not ratified, so we got Amendments 2 through 12, which we now call 1 through 10, our Bill of Rights. The first one uh, was apportionment of representatives to the people, and that is still an open amendment that has not closed. The second one was in dealing with uh, Congress voting themselves pay raises. That was uh, ratified in 1992. Uh, finally, well, let me, I don't have my mouse with me. Conventions were not an unknown entity. There's been some disagreement with, well, you know, Article 5 doesn't really talk an awful lot about how to do a convention. Well, the reality is the conventions were so well known, the Founding Fathers did not consider having to write the specific instructions on how to do a convention. There had been 27 conventions alone during Ben Franklin's lifetime. And even after that, uh, we have had conventions, of course, the Philadelphia Convention of 1780. There was a Boston Convention of 1780, a Hartford Convention of 1780. Uh, we had, um, even after that, the Washington Conference of 1861 was an attempt to avoid uh, the Civil War. And then we even had our own convention here in Nashville, Southern Movement for Unity in 1848 and 1850. What's unique about these conventions is that the journals have been saved for posterity. The uh, rules that they set up have been able to, to be searchable, researchable. And so we've looked at all of those. And what we've noticed is that all of the conventions follow the same format the same one vote, one state, the same delegate selection, the same process all the way through. So there's a legal precedent behind how an Article 5 will be conducted that's outside of simply mentioning it in the Constitution. So the framework is already there. And we've already shown in the past that this is what we've used. To depart from that does not make any legal sense and would be legally challenged should we do that. So we have that history to go along with controlling how the process within an Article 5 goes. Fear of the process being hijacked, uh, again, historical precedent eliminates that. Uh, fear of the process being hijacked, it has to be for the same call. If it's not for the same call, you can't combine calls and create a convention of states. Uh, there has been some talk of, of George Soros. George Sor Soros is against our Article 5 application of states. He absolutely does not want it to go. However, he is working on his, and Article 5 is neutral, anyone can try to start an Article 5 convention. He is trying to, to create one, pardon me, that reverses the uh, Supreme Court's decision on whether uh, corporations are people. Uh, so, but that's his deal, and we're not playing with their field, and they certainly aren't going to like anything that we're proposing. Again, 34 states must submit the application on the same issue. Congress is required to call the convention, and this is specifically spelled out in Federalist 85, Federalist Paper Number 85. Congress's only discretion is time and place. Commissioners, delegates, uh, debates, pr uh, propose, vote upon possible amendments. They do that within the convention. Those amendments then go back to the states for ratification. And if 38 states ratify a particular amendment, then and only then does it become part of the Constitution. Convention of states, uh, again, were often held in the 1700s and 1800s. This is nothing new. We've been through this before. We just haven't had to do one in a long time. Um, the convention votes on its own, own rules. And they typically go with the, the parliamentary rules they create. Lacking that, Mason's manual is what they refer back to. 
There is a group right now. Um, they are uh, meeting together. They're state representatives from, I think it's up to about 34 states. And their sole purpose was they've looked at the landscape and have said an Article 5 convention is going to be convened. Before we get there, how about we meet together and create these convention rules, create these parliamentary rules. Uh, they started off as the Mount Vernon Assembly. Uh, they've changed their name. I believe it's called simply the Assembly of States. Everything they do is online. You can look at the video of their meetings. Everything is, is open. There's nothing closed about it. And you can see the rules that they're proposing. The idea is to have this in place so on day one, delegates can go. They can look at the convention rules. They can examine them. They've got time to examine them. They're not trying to scurry to create these things. And then they can decide, do we want these or do we want to make changes to them? Scott, can I interject? Yes. I want to point out that Sheila has been at those conventions. So if you have questions about these meetings, if you have questions about that, Sheila can answer them. Well, Sheila, we hate to put you on the spot like that, but if you would, that'd be great. And of course, I always get the, the question, if they're not following the Constitution now, why would they follow it if we amended it? Well, the reality is the federal government right now is operating in compliance with the Constitution, but it's the one that's been interpreted by the Supreme Court and by precedent from previous Congresses, using clauses that seem vague in today's vernacular. So when we talk about the Commerce Clause, we all understood, those of us who have looked at it, that the Commerce Clause was designed to, to allow the federal government to control issues between the states and commerce, not commerce inside of the states. Uh, proper, properly written amendments can leave no doubt about proper limited role of the federal government. Basically, it's an updating process, updating the vernacular that was used in the 1700s to the vernacular that's used today so that there's no misunderstanding. This is what was meant. Now, Mark Levin wrote an excellent book, and I encourage you to uh, find it if you can and read it. It's called The Liberty Amendments. And in there, the first chapter, he pretty much goes through what I did. Um, very much more eloquently than I've presented here today and with the appropriate footnotes for you to be able to research it. Uh, but he also spends the rest of the book offering some ideas, things that he would like to see. And I want you to consider these amendments as we go through them. Not so much that I'm supporting any one of those or not supporting them, but just the, the total, totality of the areas that have gone wild, that need to be addressed, that we know Congress is not going to. We are at a balanced point in time. We don't have a tremendous amount. I mean, I can't tell you in years, but we're not that far behind Greece. We're just going to do it a little bit bigger. And I'll actually use a good example, um, the Space Shuttle Challenger. When the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up, we all heard that it was from the O-rings that failed and the solid rocket boosters, and it caused uh, a, a basically a torch to come out the side and go into the other uh, liquid booster, and that caused the explosion. The reality was that is not the first time that the O-rings failed. The O-rings had failed on every flight that the shuttle took. The issue was that it never failed on any of the other flights. And this is the problem with catastrophic failure. Catastrophic failure comes in this way. It works, it works, it works, and then it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it is massive and it is disruptive. We need to fix these areas before we get to that massive destructive failure. And that failure is coming. But again, let's look at what some of the things Mark Levin was talking about. Term limits, and I think a lot of us look at that and say that's, that's a good idea. These guys are spending way too much time there. Uh, repealing the 17th Amendment. Having our senators represent states' interests. Supreme Court limits. Term limits for them, for Congress. Um, he asks for some state override. I have some questions there. But the idea is that these lifetime appointments are becoming damaging. Thurgood Marshall, in his last few years on uh, the Supreme Court, spent most of his day in chamber watching days of our lives, uh, limiting federal spending. $18 trillion in debt. We cannot continue to spend money that doesn't even exist in the universe today. Limiting taxes. And not only do we want them to balance the budget, we want to limit how much they can take from us. Eliminating death taxes. 
death taxes rob generations from the work done by previous generations. And if you have a family farm, I know someone has a family farm, that is a real issue. It doesn't take too long with land prices today to hit a million and a half to two million dollars. And suddenly you're looking at a confiscatory 40 to 60 percent of what it is you have in assets being taken by the government, simply because they want it. Uh, promoting free, exercise, uh, yeah, free enterprise clause, as he likes to call it. Uh, limiting federal bureaucracies so that laws and bureaucracies sunset. Nothing dies, and I gave the example of the rural electrification bill. Still alive today. It should have died a long time ago. And people would have loved to see the opportunity for the EPA or the uh, USDA or the uh, Education Department or, uh, you know, I'll even pick on Oak Ridge, our Energy Department. If they're great ideas, let them die and then let them get reconstructed in a more uh, useful manner to the country than what they've grown to. Kind of trimming the bushes back a bit. Protecting private, private property. Um, when a government can come in and take private property because they can get more tax revenue from a company that they can sell it to, that's not proper use of eminent domain. Amending power given to state legislatures. I'm not sure I agree with Mark on that one, but there again, it's an idea that we have gone so far off the rails that he wanted to provide a, an idea of how do we keep from having to redo an entire Article 5 again. I think Article 5 was done difficultly on purpose, and maybe it's, it's a good way it stays that way. Uh, of course, state powers to override Congress, when Congress writes a, a bill or a law that is uh, wholly uh, unworkable in the states, maybe the states should be able to get together and have some pushback back to the federal government. And then, of course, uh, amendment to protect the vote. He calls it the voter ID law. Uh, there's a couple others in there that, that I might add or some other people have suggested would be good ones. Uh, I think repealing the uh, 16th Amendment, income tax, direct taxation. There are a number of different vehicles that we can use to replace that with. I've heard a lot of uh, a good talk about the fair tax. I've studied it a little bit. I'm not 100% convinced that's the way to go, but there's ideas out there that we can research and look at that provide a better solution than every year filling out a form back to the government telling them how much I made and where I spent it and how I spent it, along with all the minutiae receipts that have to go with it. And the untold billions of dollars in man hours spent preparing those reports for the government. Limiting executive orders uh, to administrative purposes only. Executive orders have way too much power today. Uh, there are some people that suggested going back on the gold standard for a currency. That certainly should be something to be looked at. Some kind of hard commodity that we can tie our currency to. Limiting federal lands. Uh, returning federal lands in the western states for sale to citizens. Uh, reducing the deficit when you, when you do that. But why is the federal government holding on to lands it doesn't need to hold on to? We already have set-asides for national parks. How much more do they really need? Uh, properly uh, defined uh, First and Second Amendments. Uh, there are some folks who think that we need to, sol to solidly state, both in the First and Second Amendments, that these are rights that precede the government, or not precede, that predate the government. They were here before the government. The government doesn't give us these rights, and with any of our rights. Our rights are given to us by God. And if we think that a government gives us rights, then a government can take our rights away. But a government given to, or a rights given to us by God is a right that the government cannot interfere with. I mean, they practically physically do. But morally and ethically, they cannot. Acknowledging life begins at conception. That is a big one for many people. Roe v. Wade was in danger of being overturned by Article 5 back in the 1980s. Actually, a little before then. Uh, what was interesting is Justice Warren Berger, which many people use his letter to substantiate you shouldn't do an Article 5, because he came out and said an Article 5 is dangerous. In Article 5, you, you could lose the Constitution. It would open it all up, and you would have to, uh, you, would, you could lose all of your rights that you have right now. Not thinking for a moment that this is the same Warren Berger who just had Roe v. Wade officiated at his court. It was his deal. He was protecting his legacy. That's what he was doing with that letter. Where we stand today in the process? Well, currently, we have three states that have actually passed what we call a model application. 
And the model application is the same. Every state, with the exception of the header, the header changes by state, of course. Uh, Florida has passed it, Georgia has passed it, and Alaska has passed it. Currently, we have 26 states that have applications in process. Uh, that means they've been introduced to the state legislature. Some are being voted on, they've been calendared, some are coming up, some are in committees, uh, and I'll tell you about ours in a minute. Uh, we have a total of uh, 39 potential by the end of the legislative year. Our year ends a little early in April. Some states go beyond that. Uh, some even go as late as November and December. So we'll have to wait to the end of the year to see how many we actually get. But there is growing momentum. There is excitement about the process because people see this is a solution. This is an answer to what we see as a ship gone, gone astray. Um, it's, and I'll steal another from a good friend of mine, it's analogous to, uh, to the captain of the Titanic, after having hit the iceberg, ordered his crew to back up and ram it again at full speed. That's what we've done with our country through the federal government. So we're looking at a way to prevent that from happening. So how is our process a little different than other convention, Article 5 conventions that have been tried uh, to be started in the past. Well, currently, for example, we're using social media very well. This is our Convention of States Tennessee Facebook page. Uh, we have 10,570 likes, which we haven't really started to grow yet, but we're working on that. Um, we have as our founders both uh, Mark Meckler, who founded uh, National Tea Party Patriots, and then Michael Ferris. Uh, many of you may not know him. Michael is founder of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. When he started fighting for homeschool rights, it was illegal in almost half the states of this country to homeschool. He did a grassroots 34 years ago, 35 now, uh, that has turned that around and it's now legal in all 50 states thanks to his leadership. He has shown that he can create a grassroots organization to accomplish something. And so when I look at the enormity of the project and then I look at the experience of bringing grassroots organizations together to do something, these are two guys that I can look to and say they've got a plan. And then when I looked at the plan, it convinced me that this was the way we do it. The mission, the overall mission of Convention of States is to urge and empower state legislatures to call a Convention of States to propose amendments to the Constitution to curb the abuses of the federal government. That's been our mission. Um, it's a national effort that we have going on to build grassroots in at least 40 states. I am the Tennessee State Director. And that's a fancy title for saying I was the first person in the state to raise my hand and say I want to do this. But I've got compatriots all over the country. And uh, I think we're up to 42 states. I've got a slide with the exact number now. And we, on a weekly basis, communicate. We email, we talk, we ask each other what's going on in our states. And this is amazing. I have not seen this much political excitement for anything since Ronald Reagan ran for president in 1980. It is just amazing to see people who have been disenfranchised by the process, who have given up on being able to do anything, suddenly stand up and say, we can do this. We can do this because they've seen the plan and they understand that this is serious business. That we need to do this. This is our last best effort. So besides the national effort, of course, we want to introduce identical bills for an Article 5. And we have done that here in Tennessee. Uh, our main sponsor has, um, sorry, has been uh, Mike Bell, and he's in the Senate, and uh, Sheila is here today and has agreed to be our sponsor in the House when we get it through committee. Currently, our bill uh, has been um, assigned to the Finance, Ways, and Means Committee. The Finance, Ways, and Means Committee have not voted on it yet. Um, I have called each of the committee members asking them where they stand on the bill, and Five of them say they're uh, supportive of the bill, and the other remaining six have not given indication one way or the other, or have not returned my call. So I am asking uh, volunteers around the state to encourage them to consider a convention of states and to uh, pass this in committee so that they can get out to the full Senate floor. But our proposed Article 5 is limited, and this is what it's limited to, and this is important. We're limiting it to imposing fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the powers and the scope and jurisdiction of the federal government, and limit the terms of official or office for its officials 
and for members of Congress. If it doesn't fall within that call, it cannot be brought up at the convention. And under convention rules, if it doesn't fit, it is a null proposal and gets passed over. But success for this plan depends on a couple of things. Uh, the plan is to build this viable organization and we're well on our way to do it. Here in Tennessee, uh, we actually have uh, four statewide offices now. We have the state director, myself. Uh, our legislative uh, liaison is Ramona DeSalvo. And Ramona is an attorney here in uh, Nashville in the entertainment industry, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Chris, Chris Adams is our coalitions director. Chris's job is to try to find other like-minded organizations uh, that can look at this and say, we want to participate. And he's out in Nashville, but is trying to cover the state from there. I'm looking for uh, assistance to him in Middle Tennessee and East Tennessee right now. And then we have um, a state information analyst. State information analyst helps us with Facebook and Twitter and gathering all of the information and using it to our best effort. Uh, Norman Bobo is here today. Uh, he, uh, whether he knows it or not, is our newest state information analyst. And then Ann Acock is uh, doing some database work for us down in Chattanooga. This is how it is, uh, it is structured. The, the grassroots coordinator on a national level talks with me. Now, being the state director, I have, of course, my legislative liaison, Ramona, and our coalition's director and our state information analyst, but also district captains. We have 99 legislative districts in Tennessee, and we are divided Tennessee up along those legislative districts. Our goal is to get a district captain in each one of those, and we actually have several district captains uh, with us here today. Where is Yvonne and Hill Rogers? They're right there, they're uh, legislative from 40, 46. I was going to say 49, thank you. Uh, Rafe Donahue, Rafe is our DC from 63. And uh, Marshall, you are down in Chattanooga Way, what's 39? I don't think I missed anyone else. Uh, they were able to make it here today. I'm thankful they, they drove all that way to be with us. But the district captains, role is to get volunteers within their district. And that's where the power comes from. Uh, we're looking to get at least 100 volunteers in the district uh, at each one within Tennessee, but we want more than that. The volunteers are important because that's where the rubber meets the road. The volunteers are what matter. When, when someone calls a representative or senator's office, it needs to be someone who lives within their district who agrees with us and says, yes, this is what we want to see have happen. We want you to participate in this. We want you to promote this. So there are 42 states that we have uh, state directors in, so I was correct there. Uh, we have coalition directors in 31 states. We have legislative liaisons in 37. We have district captains working in all 50 states. We don't have a state where we don't have some convention of states presence. We need to grow it. District captains, one per state house, as we talked about, uh, recruit and build an army of volunteers. Uh, their job is also to educate their volunteers in the local area, much like I'm, I'm doing here today. And then encouraging support for state legislators who believe in the convention of states. And of course, they've got an expected commitment level of about 15 to 20 hours per month. That's not too bad. And if you uh, are interested in helping us with this, we would dearly love your support and uh, your volunteerism as becoming a district captain. Um, Tennessee Article 5, I talked about it a little bit. Our main sponsor in the Senate is Senator Mike Bell. Uh, Mike has been a tremendous uh, advocate for us, as Sheila is a tremendous advocate. Um, they are, um, of the folks that I've met, um, they really see the light. They really understand what it is we're trying to do. They understand the enormity of the task, but they understand the desperate times that we're living in. And of course, our co-sponsor in the Senate is uh, Senator Ed Jackson. And then, of course, Sheila is here with us today. As Ronald Reagan said, when talking about grassroots and why they're important, not every state representative is going to agree with us right off the bat. And we don't necessarily need them to see the light, but we do need for them to feel the heat. I'd rather they saw the light but they're responsible for their constituents. And if their constituents want this, then they should answer to their constituents. Finally, a couple of slides of Thomas Jefferson. 
and enlightened people will never suffer what is established for their security to be perverted by an act of tyranny. So that's what we're doing. We're educating people, we're enlightening people, we're giving them the historical information, we're giving them the truth that they're not going to hear everywhere. And of course, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Freedom, as Ronald Reagan said, has to be won every generation. You cannot rely on the predecessors uh, to, to win that freedom for you. Finally, um, as I consider uh, my own military service and friends and, and uh, people I've known and people not known but have buried, I've got to ask, during this final push, during this looking for volunteers as you sit there, no one is asking anyone in the dead of night to traverse a, a ice-choked river to get to the other side, to march five miles through three feet of snow with cloth wrapped around your bloody feet to engage the most powerful, well-organized military in the world. That's already been done for you. We're just looking for some volunteers today. So with that, I really appreciate your attention through this whole um, presentation. And if you have any questions, I, Norman's got some cards. I'll do my best to answer those. And if we have further time, uh, I'll take questions from the floor. So thank you. Excuse me, my pilot's eyes have long since dimmed, and so I'm going to don some glasses and see if I can't uh, read some of these. Uh, it's an excellent question. What's better for ratific ratification, uh, convention or legislatures? We've only done it by convention one time, and I myself am personally more comfortable seeing it done through the state legislatures. Uh, the reason for that is like anything in this process, I can reach out and talk to my state legislator. Uh, my guy down where I am is a Bob Ramsey. Uh, he's a uh, dentist in the area, and if I want to talk to him, I can go to Bob's front porch and I can ring his doorbell and have a cup of coffee with him and talk to him. That's the preferred way. This way he knows what his constituents are thinking. However, that decision is Congress's decision. And certainly we as volunteers can petition our representatives to go that route, but ultimately uh, they will assign which way they'd like to do it. Why would they pick one or the other? And how do they make that? You know, that's an interesting question. They have always picked the state legislatures with the one time, and uh, again, I believe that was repeal of prohibition, and the reason for that was the expediency they wanted to get it done. They thought that a, a legislative convention would go quicker than each state house on its own. Okay. Okay, can Congress delay the convention indefinitely? Um, the answer to that is no, they can't. There is an administrative call in the word shall in Article 5. So they cannot delay. If they delay, we have legal recourse, uh, and ultimately the states can simply announce to the federal government, we have made our application, you have taken too long, we will be meeting. Okay, uh, second question, when a state passes an application, uh, how long is that application in effect? Uh, the application, our application, is an indefinite application. It doesn't have a, a sunset to it. The only way that an application uh, from our Article 5 call can be um, rescinded is if the legislature gets together and again votes and says, we don't want to do this. Um, the question, and I haven't seen it here and it may be, comes to can the delegates be controlled at the convention? And the, the answer to that is absolutely. 
the state of Tennessee, and I don't have the bill number in front of me, passed the law that said at an Article 5 convention, if a delegate does not do as instructed, they can face a Class E felony, which is punishable by up to six years in jail. Tennessee is not the only state that has done that. Uh, Indiana has done it. Several other states have done it. So they're serious about making sure that the delegates at a convention do exactly as they're instructed. Okay, uh, this question here is, could the process be controlled or limited to specific amendments? Um, our call is any amendment that limits the power and scope and jurisdiction of the federal government and limits the terms of its officials. Any amendment you can think of that can fall under there would be an acceptable amendment. They all have to get ratified anyway. Uh, the reason we don't want to limit it to specific amendment, amendments is there could be amendments out there we hadn't even considered. So I go in with a preset notion of what particular amendments will be offered. Let's let the convention do its job and uh, offer all sorts of amendments. Let's get the best ones out there and then let the best ones be voted on by our states. I'm just going to okay. give it to you. It's too hard to sort. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you can find me here. Okay, yeah, answer that one. Um, why term limits on um, SCOTUS, the uh, Supreme Court justices? Again, uh, the Supreme Court justices living a lifetime appointment have shown in their later years to be um, somewhat, uh, somewhat, um, <laughs> I'm trying to be kind, uh, somewhat distracted. And I gave the example of Thurgood Marshall spending his days watching Days of Our Lives. He was at an accelerated age. He probably should have retired long before then. They're not. And they're being politically, uh, politically manipulated, in my opinion, especially as they get to that, that advanced age. And I think that it's only prudent that since they're living longer and we're seeing these cognitive issues in older people, that they should be forced to retire. Uh, we make pilots retire. Why not our SCOTUS? You know, what, what I, I listen to this discussion, and I think this is, well, what's interesting is how easy it is to descend a little bit to these discussions. And, mm -hmm. and what we're looking for is to have this discussion at a convention. Yep. Right? So, I mean, we can have, and I'm sure some of us here in this room agree or disagree with, with term limits for individual officers or Supreme Court or President. Let's have the discussion. Right? And that's, I think, the whole point of bringing this to a national convention idea yeah. is to have the discussion on a national level. And if Tennessee wants to go in a certain way, then let's go in that certain way. Mm -hmm. We'll have that discussion and we'll have that at the convention. Well, certainly Tennessee has passed the balanced budget on it. That could be Tennessee's, um, their gift to the convention, let's say. We've got someone raising their hand. I'll, yeah, I'll, I have a question. Just real quick, Scott. Go sure. Ahead. Our committee has not calendared in the House uh, Finance Ways and Means yet. It's not come up on the calendar. Uh, we're hoping that we'll see it on the calendar soon. Uh, we are trying to impress upon the, the members of the committee just how important this is and asking for their support. Uh, of the ones that have come out and definitely said they support what we're doing, uh, we're asking folks to call them and, and just outright, would you consider being a co-sponsor? This is important enough. We'd like you to do that. So specifically, we actually sent an email to all the people that are already in our database. It went out last night, asking them, giving them their, their phone numbers, their email addresses, and asking them to email them and call, not, not one, both, if you can, mm -hmm. right? The, yeah, and um, on top of that, our Facebook page will have that up sometime t later today. We're, we're all very busy, but <laughs> we're gonna put all their names, addresses, and phone numbers It'll be easy to get on our Facebook page. You'll be able to just start dialing. You, you want that, yeah. uh, Ramona? I, I just want to say, too, you could also go, if you are not on the list or you don't get notified, you can send an email to Tennessee Board of Elections and ask them to send you a copy of the Senate Ways and Means Bill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
our list in case you're not on it already. You know, do you some up here we can take some from the field? Uh, go ahead and take one from back there, and then Rafe has a comment, and then we get back to a couple of the cards. Go ahead, Rafe. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Scott and I met with, with some of our representatives about a year ago, mm -hmm. and the, the, the point that I took away from that meeting with Mr. Posada was he said, we're not leaders, we're followers. So what if, we, if you want us to do it, tell us what to do. That's what he said, tell us what to do. And I truly may, may, not, may or may not agree with that. But he was, uh, he was, I need to hear from the people. I need to hear from the people in order to make it happen. So he said, let me know. So every now and then I Twitter Glenn and I email Glenn and I call Glenn's office just to let him know I'm still being a thorn in his side. And he, they respond to that. But if I'm the only one doing it, Mm -hmm. That's not going to work, all right? And, so it, and, and it's, it's not a hard thing to do. You type up a little email, you hit send. You pick, make a phone call, you sitting around, do a little Twitter feed thing, a little Facebook post. And I think, I would believe that those things eventually get through. And if you start getting 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 of those things, then that starts resonating. And I'm sure they will say, I guess this is the way I should go. And Sheila, Sheila's shaking her head up and down as Rafe is saying this. She's like, yeah, this is... That's what a republic is. What's that? That's what a republic is. Absolutely. You are to direct your legislators what you want them to do. By the way, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to drop in a note here as well. When, when, they, when, when this all started, Michael Ferris went out and, and actually queried representatives from around the country and asked them, State representatives now, not federal, state representatives and senators. How many calls would it take for, to move you on a bill? How many calls? Five. That's all it takes. Five. Okay? Now, if they get 100, now this is five on one side. If you get five on both sides, it doesn't count. But if you get 100, something's happening, and they are not going to ignore it. They will not ignore it. They can't. That's what we're after. That's why we want 100 people in each district. Mm -hmm. So when we put out the call that we just put out Friday night, 100 calls go into those state representatives. And in this case, since we're targeting a Senate committee, everybody in the state is targeting that Senate committee. Right? Because we all, in this case, that committee, even though they're from certain districts, in this case, they're representing all of us because they're making the call, the decision for all of us to get it through that committee. So all of us, even if we're not in their districts, we call them. That's you, you need to call. So they should they should have a thousand phone calls and a thousand emails on Monday morning, right? And time is of the essence. We will only be in session through the end of April at best. Yep, right. And he has to pass that in the Senate before I can run it in the House. So I'm going to repeat what Sheila said. Time is of the essence. It has to be passed in the Senate before we can even get to the House. Right, and it's, the House is probably only going to meet until about the first week of May. I'm saying it into the mic, at the very latest, maybe the last week of April. So I don't know if y'all know what happens in the Tennessee State Legislature every year. This happens every year. The last few weeks, it becomes pandemonium because everybody's trying to get their bills through, right? We have to get this motivated and get this moving like in the next week, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's why we're focusing on the event today. We want all of you contacting your state reps and senators today. Anyway, I'm sorry, on to the questions. Yeah. Um, let me get to one question on the card, then we'll get to yours real quick. Uh, this question is actually a good one, uh, not that they're not all, but it's, it's a good procedural one. If 38 states were involved in the Convention of States, would amendments be proposed and accepted at the same time? And the answer to that is no. This is a Convention of States for proposing amendments. Once the amendments are proposed, that convention is dissolved. It then goes back to the state or the federal route on how it gets ratified. If it's done to the state legislatures, the individual amendments go back to the state legislatures and each house votes on them. If it's done by, uh, amend or done by convention of the states, then each state has their own intra-convention and they vote on them individually there. So, and you had a question, sir? I'm one of the, uh, I don't need it, I'm a teacher. <laughs> uh, we want to, we want to do it. I am a cognitively challenged old person, you mentioned. So <laughs> help me with this, please. How are the delegates to the original convention selected 
by the states and how many would there be from each state? The states are free to decide on who goes by any means that they want. There's nothing that says they must do it this way, they must do it that way. Uh, the state of Tennessee, uh, through that bill that was passed, uh, controlling delegates has uh, stated the number of delegates um, and the number of alternate delegates that will go. But they haven't, uh, I don't believe when I read through it that it specified how they were to be chosen. This is what's very important in this whole process. It is, as Sheila pointed out, a representative form of government. We need to be in touch with our representatives. We need to let them know what we want to see happen. And that's how the states are controlled. And the way we choose to differ will be different than how Mississippi chooses to do it, which will be different than, than how uh, Indiana chooses to do it. But it'll be the way that we in Tennessee decide. No one else deciding for us. Does that help answer? Yes. OK. OK. You can take one there, and I'll, I'll take this guy when you're done with the next question. Okay. Okay, I had a couple of questions dealing with term limits themselves. And again, I'm not here offering, under Convention of States, any particular amendment that we'd like to offer. And so term limits, again, the, the details of term limits would be something that would be discussed at a convention itself. And there's been a number of different ideas, a, a 6-12 rotation, you know, a, a six times in the House of Representative, 12 year total. There's any number of different ways it can be, be limited. But that is, again, for discussion at the convention itself. And then um, I have a question here about nullification and why do opponents of Article 5 uh, consider, uh, I'm not sure what that rasp, I think it's prefer it, that last word. Uh, nullification is uh, an idea that was bantied about by James Madison uh, in, in the nullification uh, crisis that happened in the early 1800s. And basically what he said was that nullification under itself is not the appropriate way. Number one, it, it would derail the supremacy clause that is in the Constitution. And you cannot have a single state nullifying what the federal government does because now you're, you're in anarchy and chaos. Then every state can pick and choose what federal law they want, what federal law they don't want. They provided a process that if a state doesn't like a law, the state can go through the process either through their state representatives, which, which would have been the Senate, which thanks to the 17th Amendment we no longer really have, to go to Washington and say, hey, as states, we don't like this particular bill. Let's not pass it. And then we as people representatives have our house where if we like it, we can counter that. But that's how it was originally set up. So the amending or, or the uh, nullification issue is probably the quickest way to lead to anarchy and a downfall. <coughs> And that's not the process that our founding fathers wanted us to go through. There are some nullification issues that get into some real uh, fine details on the law, but in this case, it's simply too big of an issue and not applicable to what we're trying to do. And I'm, I'm going to add a couple things. One was a question, but then um, on the nullification, there are some states who want the federal government involved in these things. So let's just say nullification will work, which it, I personally don't think it's, number, it's, it's legal, number one. Number two, practically won't work. But number three, let's say that some states did nullify. The states who didn't nullify would still have the federal government involved in those programs, whatever those programs are. And guess what? The states that did nullify would still be paying for it. Think about it. We're still going to get taxed. We're going to nullify a state law, I mean a federal law. Let's just say that it works, which won't work. But let's say that we nullify a federal law in our state. We're still getting taxed, and the benefit is still going to the other states. It, it, it just doesn't work. Flat out doesn't work. The question that came up was, eight was the bill number. And I, I want to say it's 67. Yeah, SJR 0067, Senate Joint Resolution. Yeah. And this is a little bit different. These are, these are not normal bills. These are resolutions. Now, they, they go through the same or similar process, but what's different about them is it's a joint resolution that does not go to the governor. The governor does not see this bill. It goes to the Senate. That's where we started. It'll go to the House. And once the House passes, the Senate and House pass it, that's it. We're done. The governor does not see it. No, the House bill is different. Do you remember the number? I don't remember the no, number. No, the House bill will be the same one. The same number? No. Yeah. 
the same number. It's it's a Senate joint resolution, so okay, it'll be that right. all the way through, right. unless uh, Sheila can can direct otherwise. Yeah, and unfortunately Sheila had to leave. Right. So. Yes, with regards to the nullification, mm -hmm. if a chunk of the if a federal law is blatantly in violation of our constitutional rights, should a state not have the, the right to nullify that law in their territory? What we have right now is um, the ability of states to use several processes to stop that law. The first process is through Congress, through their representatives in the Senate, and then their representatives uh, in the House. And that has not worked well for us in the past. That is why our founding fathers put in Article 5. They understood that this day was coming, that there would be a time when, in our case, Washington now, would be unresponsive to those very charges, and that there needed to be a clear way, a legal way, a way that avoids um, massive battles, per se, by creating this amending process. So. Um, yeah. Well, there's there's one more here, um, and it's an interesting question. I've had people ask me this: Is there any reason to believe that there will not be any 2016 elections? I've got to say, I, I do not believe that. I believe fully that there will be 2016 elections. If there is not 2016 elections, then all this is off the table. We've already lost everything. It's all done for, uh, and then you've got two choices: you can hide or you can fight. And let me tell you, I have been in countries that were involved in civil war. Civil war is ugly, it is nasty, it is, it's undescribable. And the people who are hurt most by it are the most innocent, the ones that we are uh, proclaimed to protect. And that's our widows and orphans. They pay the highest bill when it comes to civil war. We need to avoid that at all costs, whatever we need to do. And this is the legal, ethical, moral way to prevent that. It's the right way to address these abuses that we're seeing coming out of Washington. All right, I'll take one more. Uh, there's several that were identical. Uh, one was uh, wondering if they can get a copy of my uh, added suggested amendments and then some other information. I've got a, a volunteer sheet set up in the back. If you want to volunteer, please sign up on that. If you just want more information, just put a note in there, more information, with your email address, and I'll send you a copy of all of the things that I had for handouts today that I can, including the suggested amendments, uh, including, if you didn't get a copy of Virginia's 1789 uh, application for an Article 5, I'm more than happy to email that to you. And then you'll have that right there. What would prevent at the convention an amendment being brought forward that is not really consistent with the, the scope of the call? Who would adjudicate that? Okay, that would be um, the, the chief board at the amendment. Um, they would look at that and it would, it would basically the way the, the convention would be set up, there'd be committees to look at different amendments. And then the committees would come back and report to the body of the convention. And they would recommend whether they should be voted up or down and why. If an amendment comes up, a proposal, that isn't per our call, then whoever chairs the committee has the responsibility of, of saying this does not meet our call, it's not going to come up for a vote. But let's, let's say that, that for some unknown reason, um, the Kool-Aid was spiked that day, and they all got drunk, and they all said, we should rename Tuesday Purple Day, uh, some other such thing, and it gets out. It still has to be ratified by 38 states before it could ever become an amendment to the Constitution. Okay, thank you. So. And I want to point out, this, this is a, it's a tall hurdle. Yep. 38 states is a very tall hurdle, but I'm going to point out one thing. That means both houses in 38 states. So let's say that a bad, this is a really important, let's say a bad amendment comes out of the process which, again, we don't think will ever happen. Well, let's say that everyone gets gassed or nuked or whatever and something happens and a bad amendment comes out. It only takes one house in each of 13 states to block that amendment. That's all it takes. 
We have 30 states that are controlled in both houses by Republicans and more states that are split, Republican and Democrat. It only takes 13. We have 69, 67, I forget what it is. It only takes 13 houses. And we have 60-something of them controlled by Republicans. Maybe some of those might get passed through some of the Republican houses, maybe. But they're not going to make it through. I mean, there's 13, all it takes is 13 to block it. It's not hard. So this, the risk here is zero. I, I, you can't describe it anything other than zero. If something bad does happen to come out of the convention, we don't think it will for a variety of reasons. We won't go through the whole, there's a whole list of them. One of them you mentioned earlier was the delegates, and we control the delegates by the states. That, you know, there's a whole host of reasons it won't happen. But if it did, we have a safety valve in, those, in that, the ratification process. Uh, just a couple more. Most of these are, are um, close enough uh, that I think I might have answered those. Um, what is expected of volunteers? And that depends on what you're able to do. At a base level, we're needing people who are willing to, once they receive an email or a text alert, to call their representative, whether it be uh, the House or the Senate, and, and explain to them in a kind way why they want them to support Article 5. And we emphasize that. I mean, these people work hard. Um, there is an awful lot that they do up in Nashville. There's a lot of interests that are pulling them one way or the other. Um, my goal is to present this as the reasonable man's solution to the massive situation that we're in today. And it is that reasonable man's presentation that will win, win the day on this. When they see that this is serious, that this is contemplated, that this is the right way to go because it fits within a legal confine. Uh, we are, after all, a, a nation of laws, we're supposed to be. Um, they, will, they will respond to that, I'm convinced. That is the way we, we should. Um, Let me take a question forward. back here, Scott. Uh, yeah, um, see, uh, one of the representatives, I don't see her now, but. She had to leave. Oh. Yeah. She said that um, we only have to like April the 1st or the last week uh, in, in April or something. I mean, how often do That's, they get together and, and meet? I mean, they, what are our deadlines? Mm -hmm. They start in January each year, um, typically the last couple weeks in January. And then they go to the end of April, sometimes June, uh, when they have uh, balanced budget issues they're dealing with. But mostly by the end of April, first week of May they're pretty much done. The process for the bill is that it goes through the committee on the Senate. Once it comes out of committee, it goes to the Senate floor. Once it's voted on the Senate floor, if it passes, then it goes to the House and starts the process over again. There's a question whether it has to go to a House committee or not, or whether it just goes directly to the House floor. And uh, I'm sure I can get uh, clarification from that on Sheila uh, when I talk to her on Monday. So I've got one more question back here. Okay. Yes, sir. Just to be crystal clear, our very first priority is to get a state convention, and then the first priority of that is to, as soon as possible, contact three separate entities, the Senate Ways and Means Committee, the state representative of each of us, and the uh, state Senate for each of us, senators for each of us. Is that is that right? I mean, that's our well, immediate the, requirement. The immediate requirement is contacting the members of the Senate uh, Finance Ways and Means Committee. They have Senate Joint Resolution 0067 with them now. It has not come up on the calendar, and it's going to take calling those members to get them to get that calendar and to vote to release it from the committee to the Senate floor. So that's the first thing we need to do. Uh, if, you, if you go to our Facebook page later today, there'll be a list of who those senators are, the ones that support. Uh, we're asking you to, to call them and thank them for supporting them. And for the ones who haven't uh, committed one way or the other or haven't gotten back in, uh, back in contact with us from our contacts, uh, ask them to support the Convention of States and to vote for it on a committee. So Once it comes out of committee, then it goes to, I'm sorry? Uh, I have the list. <laughs> Bill Ketron is on there. Um, is my is my folder right there by you, Norman? My black folder. Mark Norris. 
Mark Norris, Farrell yes. Hale. Um, we don't, I don't have a response from him. We don't have responses from Reginald Tate, Thelma Harper. Um, mm -hmm. I heard groans. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Randy McNally, yeah, Randy, Randy McNally um, is the chair. Randy McNally is a supporter, according to his staff. Farrell Hale is a supporter. Yep. And Doug Overbay, I have talked to him uh, finally on Friday. And uh, despite the fact that he's received 160 petitions, has said he hasn't looked at the issue and doesn't know where he falls on it. And he's my senator, so. Do you remember what I said earlier? They don't normally get many calls. They will be on there. They will be on the Facebook page. We also. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go back to your question. What's the first thing you need to do? I'm gonna write down this URL. Go to COS Action. COS Action .com, Okay. That site will ask you for your address. This is the easiest way to do this. This and this literally takes you 30 seconds. Okay. You can do it right now on your phone. If you want to go, you can go to your phone today, right now, cosaction.com. Give it your address, and it will send an email to your state senator and your state rep. Period. Done. You've already got that. That this first step is done. The other thing that's really important about that, and you know, the first step is the most important, but it's also important because that gives us your address and gives us your contact information. When we are ready to pressure senators and, and representatives, we can contact you. We have to know who you are. If we don't know who you are, we can't contact you. So we got to know who you are, and that cosaction.com will tell us who you are. Okay. Now we're also just like we mentioned, we're you know putting up the list of of state reps and senators that are on that Senate committee. Now I'm, I've I've been ex I've learned a lot in the last couple of min uh, months about this legislative process. You know what really bugs me about Insure Tennessee? It wasn't. I'm glad it didn't pass. It wasn't, it was that it took two days when there were so many other things that were so much more important, it was such a waste of time. That's what really bugs me. But there are, what happens is these committees decide what's important and they calendar those things first. What this means is that they're deciding very, um, in a hidden way, they're kind of effectively deciding that this is not important. That's why we have decided since we have not had any action after the phone calls, we haven't had the action. It's now time for us to make them feel the heat, right? So today is the day. You know, by by Monday, we want thousands, if we can get them, thousands of emails in each one of those senators' email boxes. And on Monday morning, we want their phone lines to be melted. Call them. Sure. It's that simple. Got a okay. question right there. I called on one of the things y'all recommended, and um, I got a secretary. How effective is leaving a message or being to speak with somebody directly? Or well, you can always ask to speak to them directly, um, but if you can only get your secretary or their assistant, they are pretty good at keeping a tally. Okay. So, Norman. It's yeah. still a call. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> even though we have a super duper majority in our legislature, we do not have a, a majority of conservatives. We do not. When, um, when something like this does not get put on the calendar it's left to the end of the calendar where everything is pushed through as fast as these are the things they don't want to deal with mm -hmm. so actually yes it's important to contact your own rep and your own senator but get the names of the ways the finance ways and means and hit those hard and then find out if in the house it's going to go to committee but I wouldn't waste my time doing anything except the Senate Ways and Means yep. because it must pass there. So that's just a recommendation. Yeah. And the Facebook URL, Norman? You can give that to me. Oh, you know what? If you go up on Facebook and you type in the search line, Convention of States Tennessee, our Facebook page will pop up. It's really just Convention Space of States Tennessee. And our, our, our page will pop up. That's the easiest way to get to it. Actually, I wonder if I captured that here. No.
That's it. Yep, you, you want them to vote yes. You, you don't, in fact, I can tell you without a doubt, mm -hmm. they do not read these emails. They count these emails. It, giving them lots of explanations and reasons and all that other stuff, they don't have time. Put the resolution number in the subject line. Yeah, resolution number in the sub, SJR 67, in the subject line. Vote yes. Send it to them, please vote yes. That's all you have to say. You don't, they, they don't, they don't have the time. They get, they do get a lot of email. Yeah, they do. Um, and by the way, they're not going to be happy with us. <laughs> because, because they can't get to other stuff because, yeah. right? So, anyway. Who's on the other side? I mean, so if we're, if we're going to send them 3,000 pieces of information. Who is it? Is there anybody fighting against, actively fighting against us? Yeah, there are, there are organizations. I can mention George Soros is one of them. Uh, his Wolfpack organization definitely does not want our Article 5 going forward. Because we're talking about limiting the federal government, they're talking about expanding the federal government's powers. Uh, there are other groups that uh, have unfounded fears, and I'm hopefully that after today's presentation, I've been able to address those, who see a danger in, in going with an Article 5. They think that it could end in a uh, constitutional convention. Well, if we're really that far gone, uh, we've already lost. This is the last measure we need to take to make sure that we do it the right way. Yeah, and, I, I, I want to speak next. Yeah, my question is kind of along the same line. Number one, uh, who are, are there federal reps who are supporting this, this movement? Um, and secondly, how do you expect the, uh, the Fed to begin to fight back in, in terms of what specifically are we going to see? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. From what I've seen in all my years of politics, I am firmly convinced and I tell folks this, at this point in my life, I am an equal opportunity curmudgeon. I dislike both parties. I dislike them because they are statists. They have power in Washington, and they're not going to freely give it up. I'm thoroughly convinced of that. And when this gains momentum, they will fight it tooth and nail. One of the reasons that we're having a model application where every word in the application, every period, every apostrophe, every comma is identical, so that Congress can't sit there and look at it and go, well, that one doesn't meet, it's got an extra period. That one doesn't meet, it's got an extra T. We want to avoid that. Um, but we do have supporters in Washington. Um, Mike Lee is a supporter. Uh, Ted Cruz is a supporter. Um, oh, goodness. <laughs> Uh, Tom, yep. Tom, and yeah, Tom, Tom Coburn, Coburn is a, yeah, is a former, Coburn, former senator. But he's a supporter. Uh, Mike Huckabee is a supporter. Alan West is a supporter. Um, Sarah Palin. Uh, I mean, there's a whole list of them, and those aren't yeah. senators. But one thing about it, one reason why it's hard to answer this question is because they're not involved. Yeah. They don't, they don't have to answer this question. They will not take any votes on this other than voting on when to call it, and then when, it come, when amendments come back, which way they get ratified in each state. That's the only involvement that they have. So they're not being asked this question. So yeah. we can't, we're not going to get positions from these guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, and they shouldn't be. That's the purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several, or I know I think at least three, Article 5 efforts going on. Mm -hmm. Is there any coordination among the groups at this point? There's not any. Um, one of the things that we have done is we've uh, reached out to some of the other uh, Article 5 proponents. And what we have offered is the same thing I told the state legislatures last year, um, Beth Harwell and Glenn Quesada and Dennis Powers. Uh, I had told them, you know, it's great that you want to pass the balanced budget amendment, but that is only a small band-aid over a sucking chest wound. It's not going to help, pardon my graphic example. We need more comprehensive things. So if a balanced budget amendment is really want what you want, let that be Tennessee's contribution to a broader convention. And we've made the same offer to the other groups. You know, great that you want to do a balanced budget. Bring that idea into the convention. Let that be one of a number of amendments that we can offer that can correct the ship of state. For what it's worth, their opposition to that when we were talking to these mm -hmm. representatives was that it's difficult to get agreement on one thing. Getting agreement on a big thing is hard. 
And our response to that is, we don't need agreement here. That's the job of the convention is to figure out what to set up. So our, so our take has always been, you're covered with us, but we're not covered with you, so join our group. Yep. So, so while we support the balanced budget idea, um, that's not the only thing we support. Again, the balanced budget, in my view, would also need to have spending caps on it. Because if it's just a balanced budget, all we've given Congress was uh, a blank check to raise taxes however they want. You want to take any more cards there? Uh, and I think I've gone through the cards. If, if I haven't gotten your question, I apologize, and I'll be available afterwards to go through them. But let's do two more. Given the fact that there are a lot of very liberal states, if you tried to analytically determine the probability that you could get 38 states to approve amendments that would reduce the size of government? Remember, we have control of 69 state houses across the country. And of the ones that we don't have control of, they are pretty close on the line. And this is where the grassroots comes in. As Ronald Reagan said, you don't need them to see the light. They just need to feel the heat. And Ronald Reagan was very successful in getting many of the ideas he wanted implemented, even though he was working with a Democrat Congress and a Democrat Senate. But he did it by going directly to the people, offering them this solution. Basically, he marched under the banner of liberty and said, if you agree with me, join me and contact your congressmen and senators. Let's get this done. And when they felt the heat, that's when he was able to accomplish things. So in those states where we don't have uh, Republican control, we're certainly going to use the heat method. I'd much rather they saw the light and agreed with us, but we'll do it any way we can. So just this, this actually is something, and um, I was watching um, about three or four months ago, um, we mentioned earlier that the states have been sending representatives to this, this um, assembly. Uh, the assembly of states. It yeah. used to be, I always know it as Mount Vernon because that's how it started. And I actually watched the video of, of that process. And one of the things that this, that most of them that were there, there were a couple of Democrats, I think, but most of them that were there were Republicans. And I'm telling you, they, their desire is to get Democrats involved in this process. Mm -hmm because they know that in order for us to get past that hurdle of 38, we need some Democratic support. Now, we don't need a lot, but we do need some, and that's where that heat comes in. But where I'm going with this, the ones that, the, the amendments that are gonna pass are the ones that are really popular with the people. Term limits, balanced budget, with spending cuts, because everyone asks that question. Um, there, and those, are, those are the ones that are for sure, almost, almost for certain gonna pass. My personal opinion, I think the 16th Amendment will get repealed. I think that has a really good chance of getting through. There are a lot of people that are already on board with that. Different techniques, different solutions, all that kind of stuff, I get that. But everyone's on board with getting rid of the income tax and the IRS. If that comes out of a convention, a convention in the next year or two, it's gonna happen. But anyway, what I'm saying is it's only the really popular ones. Now some of the ones that we wanna see you never know. You've you know, you got to ask. We, but we got, that's, and actually the point is, if we don't do this, it'll never happen. So this is the way to that, this is that path to that well, solution. I'll take one more question. Uh, my father, friend in the back of the hat. Yes, sir. Uh, I can speak. Uh, I know, but we want to go question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just real quick, uh, could you clarify, I noticed that three states were on board, Florida, Alaska, and Georgia. <laughs> um, with that being said, can you give us a little bit more detail why they jumped on board first, and then okay. what do we need to do with it? the same process as what Florida did, what Georgia did, or Alaska? That's actually an excellent question. Uh, just so that you know, the velocity the Convention of States has, we started this less than 18 months ago. Alaska, Georgia, and Florida had the most forward conservative group in the country at that time. And when their assembly started in January, they were quick to jump on it. They were quick to get it done because the assembly members themselves saw the danger and were, in this case, actually leading their people as opposed to being led by the people. So they were very three, very quick to jump on this. And of course, as soon as the legislative session opens, it closes a several months later, like what we're seeing, you know, end of April, first week of May, and we're done. And we can't get anything done until the following year. Well, this year, we've got 29, and we're expecting up to 39 states to start the application process the same way that we did. So the velocity that we're looking at is tremendous. And in political speak, this is light speed to have something go this fast. And so when, they got the bill where they got the committee to pass 
actually went through the Senate and the, and the House. That's why they were able to go ahead and get those passed. Exactly. So we're in the behind this, basically Florida and Alaska to them, try to get to where they are now. Right. They got the bill passed, which is JSR 67, Seven. whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'll, sorry. That's okay. Okay, so uh, make sure that's where we're at. Yep, so this is where we're at. We need to get this out of committee, and those calls to those committee members are going to be the very first priority, and then to the Senate members after that once it gets out of committee. So, so we think the entire process for an, for an amendment convention to be called will take about how long? Well, here in Tennessee, if we pass this by the end of April, we've done our part, and now what we need to do is continue to build the grassroots because this is a long process. We have to shepherd this through the delegate convention uh, committee members meeting. We have to shepherd this through proposed amendments. We have to shepherd this on the amendments that come back, which ones we want them to vote on. So we're not looking at simply asking our legislators to do something and then go away again. We need to be involved every step of the way. So for us, our part would be done in April. We would continue to build that grassroots to make sure as this goes further, we'd have control. We are hoping that by uh, the end of 2016, that we would have the requisite 34 states to call a convention. And how long has the balanced budget amendment been considered? When was the first state? How, long, how many years has it been, the balanced uh, budget amendment? It's been 30-something. Yeah, 30 years? Yeah. yeah. So that tells you the difference. Yeah. This, one thing also, I haven't been stated, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, what I haven't been stated yet is one of the reasons, one of the things that's happened in the past is when a specific amendment is proposed by a lot of states, Congress decides to act on their own. They're, in other words, they're already feeling that heat, and they'll cut the process off by acting on their own. By doing this very general call that doesn't have any specific amendments in it, we cut off that avenue. They can't respond to this. There's no set of amendments that they can respond to. They can't do it on their own because... Which means Congress can't adopt an amendment and pervert it into something to their benefit and offer exactly. that instead. So, so by have, keeping it general, we keep, the, we keep control. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate the time that you guys took to stand here and listen to me and uh, to go through the questions. If you have questions that I really haven't addressed or answered, I'll be happy to stick around for a while and talk with you on those. Um, as far as uh, what you can do, Call the, uh, the committee members immediately. Go to our Convention of States Facebook page. And again, and if you just search for Convention of States Tennessee, it'll come up with our page. And right there at the top, it'll have those members. It'll have their phone numbers. It'll have their uh, email addresses. And it'll have whether they're a supporter or whether it's unknown. So that's the very first thing. But in addition to that, we need people to volunteer to be a district captain. And so I've got a sheet in the back. You can sign up to volunteer. You can sign up just to be someone who calls. You can sign up to be a district captain. Uh, you can sign up for willing to walk your neighborhood and talk to your neighbors about this. Or you can simply say, I'd like to get some of the material you handed out. Here's my email address, and I'll email you copies of that. So uh, with that, again, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Oh, <laughs> that's all right.